Welcome to today's topic in the webinar series, Hypertension and Atrial Fibrillation, a risky couple even more when the family expands. Today, Associate Professor Pengo from Milan will present to us the uninvited bed partner, obstructive sleep apnea. Martino Pengo is a consultant in internal medicine with a special interest in sleep and cardiovascular disease. Martino, please go ahead. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you again for your kind introduction. Um, today we're going to discuss uh, quickly and about uh, something to be considered in patients with hypertension and AF. And I'll, I'll tell you why uh, it, it's important to consider this important factor. So um, I think we have seen in the previous presentations that um, hypertension can be an important risk factor for atrial fibrillation. Um, and in fact, in patients with hypertension, we, we often see uh, the development of, uh, of, uh, of, of cardiomyopathy uh, through the uh, uh, initial diastolic dysfunction of the left ventriculum and the increased uh, wall thickness of, of the ventriculum. Uh, these initial changes then can lead to uh, changes in the atrium, so an increased uh, pressure uh, inside the atrium uh, and an increased thickness as well. That can then cause uh, the enlargement of the atrium, which we know is a uh, a very well-known hallmark of the atrial cardio cardiomyopathy that can um, be associated with atrial fibrillation. So uh, in, within this uh, pathophysiological um, uh, pathway that we have, uh, that we see in this slide, in this slide, uh, also the sleep apnea can be an additional risk factor that can uh, affect different stages of this uh, process, uh, being one of the causes of the development of hypertension. Uh, sleep apnea can also uh, be associated with uh, a left ventricle and diastolic dysfunction and can be associated as well with an enlargement of the left atrium. So as you can see, sleep apnea can be certainly uh, something to be, to be considered and that can play an important role in the development of atrial fibrillation in patients with hypertension. Let's discuss briefly uh, about uh, what sleep apnea is, um, uh, starting from the definition. So, circuit sleep apnea is characterized by episodes of total or partial uh, upper airway obstruction, usually lasting more than 10 seconds. This is clearly shown uh, on your left hand side. As you see, uh, this is a trace of, of a sleep study uh, where the repetitive airway occlusions are causing uh, desaturations at night and arousals from sleep. So, as you, as you can imagine, uh, the presence of these repetitive episodes of uh, airway occlusion during the night can cause increased respiratory efforts and arose from sleep uh, required to re-establish airway patency. And these can also be responsible of sleep fragmentation that can uh, then lead to uh, the typical signs and symptoms uh, associated with the disease. So we have daytime sleepiness, which is the most important symptom uh, that can uh, that, that is also associated with important uh, consequences, such as uh, road traffic accidents. There are also nocturnal symptoms, such as gnawing and choking um, episodes at night, that are often complained by patients with sleep disorder. So uh, uh, this uh, sleep disorder breathing. Um, can be caused uh, by, the, by the obstruction uh, in the airway, uh, which is represented in this MRI on, on your um, uh, right hand side. Uh, as you can see, the most prominent muscle, the genigrossal muscles of the tongue, uh, tends to collapse backwards, causing obstruction at night. Uh, and this is uh, one of the possible causes of, uh, of uh, sleep disorder breathing, but certainly the most common. From um, a cardiovascular perspective, this, uh, these episodes of area of occlusion uh, are not uh, uh, so um, uh, well tolerated by our, our heart and our body in general. Because as you see in this slide that shows you um, the, uh, the blood pressure values measured continuously with a B2B -B device during and after a respiratory event, you see that blood pressure tends to, to, to rise at a uh, at night uh, and peaking uh, towards the arousal from sleep. Um, these uh, changes in blood pressure are associated with changes in sympathetic nervous system activity, 
which was measured in this experiment um, with a micro-neurographic technique. So if these episodes occur um, very often during the night, this can certainly change the nocturnal profile, uh, blood pressure profile of our patients. And from a pathophysiological perspective, what happens uh, is uh, when we have uh, athletic events, we have changes in intrathoracic pressure and an increased uh, oxygen demand uh, due to a change in wall tension of the left ventricle. But unfortunately, uh, due to the uh, low oxygen de delivery caused by intermittent hypoxia, um, uh, uh, these can uh, be responsible of oxidative stress and inflammation. Uh, and as we have seen previously, uh, sleep apnea is associated with arousal from sleep that causes an increased sympathetic activation and raises a heart rate and blood pressure. So all these uh, pathophysiological uh, Aspects can uh, be uh, the uh, can confirm the biological plausibility uh, of the association between sleep apnea and the development of cardiovascular events and AF. When we run a 24-hour blood pressure tape uh, in a patient with hypertension and sleep disorder breathing, this is what we often see. Uh, we see a, um, a, a, an altered a nocturnal uh, blood pressure uh, pattern. Uh, with a, a rising pattern with blood pressure that goes up and, and does not dip at night uh, by 10% as we are used to see in a patient with a normal blood pressure profile in the 24 hours. So this pattern is very typical uh, in patients with sleep disorder breathing as we have seen uh, these um, uh, cycles of oxygen saturation and arousal from, from sleep can uh, uh, rise blood, blood pressure causing nocturnal hypertension and a rising blood pressure pattern. Um, so it is clear that atrial fibrillation, uh, arterial hypertension and sleep apnea do share uh, several uh, risk factors and there are three conditions that uh, should be managed uh, together because they uh, can all increase the overall risk uh, uh, profile of our patient. So in, in patients with sleep apnea, the prevalence of hypertension can be a, ha, as high as uh, 80%. Uh, on, the, on the other way around, in hypertensive patients, sleep apnea prevalence can be around 40%, but in patients with resistant hypertension can, be, uh, can, in, can increase up to 90%. Uh, so as, as you can see from the epidemiologic point of view, um, the presence of sleep apnea is uh, somewhat... Uh, quite frequent uh, in patients with hypertension. And the association between the, um, uh, the severity of sleep disorder breathing, usually represented by the acne hypoxia index, the AHI, and blood pressure is quite a tight uh, uh, dose-dependent relationship. Now, if we look at uh, how uh, uh, sleep apnea can be associated with hypertension, we will see similar figures. So, so sleep disorder breathing is, is present uh, between 21% and 74% uh, of AEF patients. So certainly um, a clinically meaningful uh, relevant uh, prevalence uh, that we can often see uh, even when we run a sleep study. So on this slide, you see uh, an oxygen trace with the oxygen saturations and uh, on the heart rate trace, you, you will see the the, 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 the high variability which corresponds uh, to uh, AF. So it, it, it is not something that we uh, find so rarely, and uh, for this reason, it's, it is important to screen um, patients with sleep disorder breathing for AF. Most importantly, sleep disorder breathing and sleep apnea in general is associated with reduced uh, effectiveness of the, the treatment for AF. So if, if we try to uh, attempt a, pharmaco a pharmacological treatment with antiarrhythmic drugs or to uh, try a, a, a catheter ablation of AF, then uh, we might have less uh, effectiveness, in, in particular in patients with sleep apnea. We do have data in observational studies that the treatment of sleep disorder breathing uh, by positive uh, airway pressure can indeed uh, be associated with a lower recurrence of AF. But the data from the RCTs are not so um, uh, homogeneous in terms of showing a net benefit uh, of treating a patient with um, sleep disorder breathing and AF uh, uh, with CPAP with the aim of reducing AF recurrence. 
However, if we treat a patient with sleep apnea with CPAP, uh, just to remind you, CPAP is a, is a, is a device that delivers uh, positive airway pressure uh, to the airway of our patients in order to uh, resume airway patency. It is basically made of a mask uh, connected uh, to uh, a ventilator by a plastic tube. And this can restore the normal breathing, uh, eliminating pretty much all apneas and hypopneas. And in this slide, you see clearly that if you have uh, if you are not treated for sleep apnea, then you do see this rise and fall of blood pressure at night um, due to apneas. Whilst if you are on CPAP, your blood pressure tends to, to remain stable uh, at night uh, due to the lack of apneic events uh, going on. So certainly, uh, if we um, put up, to, uh, if we analyze the, band, the, the randomized control trials, um, uh, addressing and trying to understand the effectiveness of CPAP treatment on blood pressure, we will, you will see that um, blood pressure can be reduced by CPAP uh, uh, modestly, but still in a significant uh, and, and clinically meaningful way um, by two millimeters of mercury. Uh, so this change can be even more relevant for nocturnal blood pressure being um, as high as four millimeters of mercury. So. From a, a hypertension perspective, uh, the treatment of sleep apnea works and can reduce blood pressure. And also, if we look at patients with AF, the treatment of, uh, of, uh, of sleep disorder breathing by means of CPAP can certainly uh, induce some changes in natural remodeling. This is a, a randomized controlled trial published very recently that shows us that there are uh, interesting changes in um, conduction velocity in patients randomized uh, to uh, CPAP or no therapy uh, and uh, evaluated with electrophysiological study. So this shows in a way that uh, CPAP can also reverse uh, atrial remodeling in AF, and this can represent the basis on why we we need to screen a patient with AF with, uh, for, for sleep apnea. Now, uh, analyzing together the studies uh, addressing the effect of uh, OSA treatment on AF, uh, certainly uh, overall uh, they favor the treatment of CPAP, although, uh, as said before, um, uh, the data are not uh, still conclusive uh, about uh, recommending to all patients with, uh, with AF and sleep apnea a treatment uh, for, uh, for sleep disorder breathing with the aim of reducing AF recurrence. And this is probably due to the fact that uh, AF is not a single episode, this is a, is a continuum that starts uh, with the paroxysmal episodes and ends up uh, in the persistent and permanent AF, particularly in patients uh, with a heart remodeling, and then uh, and in these cases, perhaps uh, treating the, the triggers and other risk factors can be less uh, uh, useful than treating uh, the problem at the beginning. Uh, when uh, there are only a few episodes of AF. Uh, and this is obviously uh, what is depicted here in this slide. If uh, having a sleep apnea for a long time can certainly contribute to uh, the, the, the progress of the structural changing or, or changes of the, of the heart, uh, which, which certainly um, uh, struggles with all the respiratory events and the changes of a sympathetic nervous system activity and blood pressure. So, uh, of course, uh, uh, you, you will see that uh, these three episodes that we have seen together today are deeply intertwined uh, because they share several risk factors and their treatment can certainly improve perhaps the overall risk profile of our patient. So let's try, try to sum up what we have discussed today with a clinical case. This was a, a case of a uh, of a, um, a male patient uh, in uh, his 60s uh, coming to us because of um, uh, a, a cardiovascular assessment. So he was a non-smoker with um, uh, mild hypercholesterolemia uh, and uncontrolled blood pressure at home blood pressure measurements. He was also a history of, of cancer. He was treated with blood pressure medications um, and diclopidine as well. Uh, on physical examination, there was a, a systolic murmur, uh, but no signs of heart failure. As you see in this slide, his blood pressure was not controlled at the uh, office measurement, and he was complaining of intrusive snoring, tatum sleepiness, and unrepression sleep. 
So when we run in this uh, patient uh, a sleep study, we, uh, we found that he had uh, several episodes of area occlusion causing desaturations at night, uh, which, uh, which were again caused by apnea and hypopnea um, reaching even uh, 60 seconds of, of duration. So the overall results of his sleep test uh, showed uh, severe um, sleep apnea with an apnea hypopnea index of 61 and a relevant uh, nocturnal hypoxia with an average of, uh, SpO2 of 90%. So we established this patient on CPAP treatment at the pressure of uh, 11 centimeters of water. And as you see from this, uh, from the repeated sleep test, there were no respiratory residual, residual respiratory events. The oxygen trace was nice and stable throughout the night. The patient was appropriately treated. Um, we then run also a transthoracic uh, echocardiogram that showed uh, structural changes of the heart, such as um, uh, a left ventricular hypertrophy as well as uh, a left atrial di uh, dilation, showing that uh, his heart uh, underwent several structural changes, which uh, are quite typical in, in a patient with uh, uncontrolled hypertension. So, Ribril was added to his current treatment, and also statin was uh, introduced to treat his high cholesterol levels. We saw the patient after one year, uh, his blood pressure was still uncontrolled. Uh, we run a sleep study uh, which showed uh, the, the presence, despite CPAP treatment, of respiratory events which were central in, na in nature at this time. I'm not going through, in, through details about central sleep apnea, but it's uh, 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 a respiratory event uh, different from the obstructive sleep apnea that we see very often in patients with cardiovascular comorbidities. We established the patient on a different ventilation, on an auto BIPAP to control also the uh, central events. And um, uh, eventually, after six months, the patient requested an online consultation because uh, whilst he was measuring blood pressure at home, uh, he felt uh, palpitations and he found on his blood pressure machine that um, heart rate was elevated. So we decided to admit the patient uh, to the hospital. The ACG, as you can see he, here, showed um, atrial fibrillation with a normal heart rate. Uh, the patient underwent uh, cardioversion and normal sinus rhythm was restored. Obviously, anticoagulant treatment was started given his um, elevated cardiomolic risk. So I guess this case uh, sums up uh, what we have discussed today. So sleep apnea is a very pr a prevalent condition in patients with atrial fibrillation and hypertension as well. We have seen that these three entities do share several uh, risk factors and a part of uh, a physiological mechanisms. Uh, sleep apnea, we have seen, can cause uh, an increased sympathetic activation and the arousal from sleep can raise uh, blood pressure both at, at daytime and at, and at nighttime. And um, this can represent an additional uh, risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Um, the treatment of sleep apnea can reverse respiratory events, can reduce blood pressure, can cause changes in atrial remodeling being a possible uh, alternative treatment in patients with recurrent AF. Um, it is important, therefore, to uh, uh, screen uh, and try to detect sleep apnea in patients with uh, both atrial fibrillation and hypertension, because treating sleep apnea can improve the overall cardiovascular risk profile of our patients. And again, patients with sleep apnea and hypertension are at, at high risk of AF, which again should be screened uh, systematically. Obviously, we need more evidence to confirm that the treatment for sleep apnea uh, can uh, treat and can reduce the overall cardiovascular risk of our patients. And most of all, we need to understand which patient can benefit the most. But certainly, um, it's a condition that uh, should be evaluated and should be considered. Uh, particularly in the routine uh, evaluation of a patient with atrial fibrillation and um, high blood pressure. And I thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much for this very nice lecture. I learned a lot from it in terms of things that I don't do on a usual basis. Um, I got two questions for you. The first one is, based on what we have discussed today, do you recommend screening for AF patients with aortic sleep 
apnea and hypertension. What's your, what's your feeling in that? If they have hypertension and OSA, do you screen? Yeah, so we, we, we uh, need to decide uh, on which patient to screen according to their um, pre-test probability of having what we are screening for. Right. So basically, patients with hypertension and sleep apnea are an, are an increased cardiovascular risk, and both conditions are a risk factor for AF. So I would definitely consider screening uh, for AF, um, perhaps uh, considering all the ways possible uh, that can allow uh, uh, the, the, the patient to uh, detect, uh, detect AF and the clinician to manage AF. So uh, considering both uh, the standard ECG, um, 24-hour um, uh, ECG tape, but also perhaps using um, some um, home devices that are usually an open uh, adopted by patients. You touched upon it in your lecture. Um... In the daily routine, when I go screen these patients, what would be my number of diagnosis of AFib? What would be the prevalence if you take patients with hypertension and uh, OSA? Yeah, so we have seen some figures during the presentation. Obviously, right. it, is, it is very difficult to, to define a clear prevalence due to the fact that uh, sleep apnea uh, in order to be uh, diagnosed, needs a sleep test, and many studies in, in the literature uh, didn't use the, the, the appropriate sleep test. But certainly, um, summing up uh, the likelihood of having um, of having AF, uh, uh, it, it is certainly uh, a very relevant, uh, very relevant screening to be performed. I would say that the, the prevalence can go can really uh, reach fifty percent. So, and this. In my in my view, um, uh, makes the screening uh, uh, mandatory uh, again, as we have seen today, in order to reduce the the cardiovascular risk profile of our patients. Oh yeah, and of course, it's an important issue. So, stroke as a consequence of a noticed AF is is the worst that can happen. So, I agree with you, screening, but. Um, yeah, sometimes it's hard to screen. And how long do you screen? Should I screen like 24 hours? Should I do a monitor for? Should I do a device? Now with uh, watches, etc., it starts to become easier. But um, yeah, that's your second question that I'm raising to you. In those patients where it's worth screening, how do you recommend we should screen? And because 24 hours, etc. I don't know. The catch the likelihood when I not specifically in these patients, but when I do a halter monitoring because patients has palpitations, the likelihood to catch some major arrhythmias isn't that high. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I mean what we have learned so far is that the screening that we have we, we are used to is probably not enough because we miss a lot of, of AF patients and unfortunately some of them end up with a stroke um, yeah. and uh, and so uh, I believe that um, uh, enhancing and uh, promoting uh, a self-assessment of patients perhaps using all the devices that are now, now available in the market I'm referring to wearables but many uh, blood pressure monitors that can be used at home that can detect AF although it is difficult to recommend a specific device uh, and although uh, this way of screening uh, has not been fully um, demonstrated to be effective compared to the standard way of screening, I think that it can, be, it can really allow us to uh, increase the likelihood to find and, and detect the EF and manage uh, the, uh, the, the arrhythmia appropriately. So this is my personal view. Um, and uh, again, we are in the area where um, the... Uh, the, the adoption of wearables is uh, is absolutely uh, huge, and many patients are now using uh, devices uh, like watches, but also blood pressure monitors. Um, so this can really be helpful in some cases, and we have proof in our clinical practice. I guess at least I have this kind of proof that some patient got the diagnosis because they um, raised the bell. Uh, 
whilst using uh, one of these wearable devices. Yeah, yeah. I think the watches, as you said, um, they're good, but you cannot just take a whole lot of data. So it is a short snapshot, whereas it would be nicer if you could catch a long, long fall, uh, how should you say, monitoring. But um, it could also be reassuring if you have, for example, palpitations and you see very clearly that it's just extra systole and that's it. But even that, we don't know the exact prognostic value, especially if it happens more than uh, occasionally. So we're learning and learning by doing, so to say. But I think, as you highlighted, it's absolutely worth doing it because we have those tools now. And therefore, I think it is important that we, we use them as a gatekeeper, a gatekeeper for or a filter for um, additional diagnostic assessment. You agree? Absolutely, cannot agree more. And again, um, most of all, we need to consider and to understand whether the adoption of these techniques can be helpful for the the day-by-day the -day management of these patients. Because obviously, as you said uh, rightly, uh, it would be nice to have a continuous trace of, of an ECG uh, um, over time. But uh, at the same time, is it, it is very helpful uh, if the patient can uh, record his or her ECG during symptoms. Because right. this uh, is certainly something that cannot be done often if you run a 24-hour um, uh, ECG tape, for example. If the patient has no symptoms during that day, then you, you, can, you might miss an important information. So given the possibility to the patient um, to, uh, to record the ECG in case of symptoms, this can certainly be of help. Yeah, I agree with you. And uh, well, with that, thank you very much for your presentation that highlights these things. And um, I think I speak for everyone that you did a great show, really brought us some new insights in a very difficult topic. Thank you very much for your time and your efforts. Thank you very much.